Welcome, my lovelies. The Green Scorpion here, ready to present another spooky, scary selection of spine-tingling species. Look, I know I didn't get this out for Halloween, but is that so surprising at this point? In the past, we did a big old monster month about the most famous creepy culprits, but fear comes in all shapes and sizes. Instead of the big chasers, what about something unsettling that hits you when you're at your most vulnerable? The silent critters creeping around when you can't see. If the name and my favorite animal didn't make it obvious, I think insects are pretty cool. I thought I got the whole tiny terror vibe out of my system when I wrote Top 10 Parasites. But while working on my last topic, Beastmasters, I had a bit of a relapse. I could have broken that list into smaller categories, people who use dogs, people who use birds, etc. I kept most of them together, but I found so many examples of bug users that I felt it needed its own separate countdown, a category I'm calling Swarm Masters. The premise is simple, one small fly is one small problem, a hundred small flies is a thousand times that problem. Some sick practitioners have weaponized our planet's petite organisms into a force that's seriously hard to fight. You got a sword? That's great, but what's it gonna do against a million creepy crawlies? Not that they have to be insects, any kind of vermin is fine with me. Rats, bats, arachnids, if you can call it an infestation, I call it a swarm. Other than that, the same rules apply. Though unlike some beast masters, swarm masters aren't usually picking up a new animal minion on the fly. Instead, they usually cultivate a collection which they keep prepared somewhere on their person, or can call in a moment's notice. Like, you know, Chino from Naruto. He'd be my perfect example, but this is a list about video game characters, so he'll have to sit this one out. Oh, and content warning. If you're freaked out by bugs, this is not gonna be a pleasant experience. No shame if you flake out on this one, because bug spray and candles are not gonna save you. These are the top 10 video game swarm masters. We're putting the Pokemon discussion at number 10 this week. It made more sense with Beastmasters, but trainers don't so much use a swarm of Pokemon, six at the most, and the smallest they get are Flabebe or Joltik. Still, I really wanted to talk about Bug-type Pokemon. The Bug-type has a stigma of being one of the weakest types in the game, especially if you've been with the franchise since the beginning. Everybody caught a Caterpie or Weedle, and even after fully evolving them, they found their power grossly underwhelming. Even the cool ones like Scyther went down pretty quick. They'd add some better ones here and there, but it wasn't until Generation 5 that we started getting more consistently good bug Pokemon. Same goes for the bug catchers, notably weak trainers you battle in the early game forests. All three bug type gym leaders are kind of jokes, and while one guy managed to sneak the type into the Elite Four, even he's underwhelming. Then we have Sun and Moon, which decided to hand the type off to its villainous team leader. Interesting move. Guzma is the head of Team Skull, admittedly one of the least effective teams in Pokemon history, but there's a reason for that. We find out that Guzma was once a young trainer like us, taking on his island trial around the same time as Professor Kukui, with the intent of one day becoming a captain. At some point he went off the rails and dropped out, deciding that instead of being successful by the standards of ancient Alolan tradition, he'd be a success on his own terms. He filled in the ranks of Team Skull with disassociated youths, and had them steal every shard of Baginium Z so that he'd be the only one to ever use it. He laughs at Kukui's mission to establish an official Pokemon League, because what's the point of trying to succeed in anything, am I right? So we eventually get the chance to fight this slacker. What you got, bro? A Spupa? Or a Venomoth? Or- OH MY GOD, WHAT IS THAT THING?! Guzma's ace, Golisopod, is the evolved form of Wimpod, which is pretty much Generation 7's Magikarp. A useless pile of suck that becomes fierce if you put the time in. Interesting that a guy who gave up on his dreams is using the poster boy for Harvard Potential. As the game goes on, he adds to his team with some of the heavier hitting bug types in the decks, the Lightning Charge Vicavolt, a pincer that he actually mega evolves if you meet him at the battle tree, and though Masquerain was never what I'd call a good Pokemon, his at least has some surprises like Ice Beam tucked away. And with Beginium Z, Guzma holds the key to the ultimate bug type move, Savage Spinout. Your Psychic and Dark types are doomed. But to get back to his character, what's the point of Team Skull? Most of its members are other kids who have dropped out from their hopes and dreams. Maybe Guzma started Team Skull as a haven for all these wayward washouts. They're all like little wimpods, just waiting for someone to put in the time and help them. But somehow Guzma lost his way, and rather than giving the kids an alternative way to grow, he's just helping them wallow in their lack of a future prospect. 
at least until you save Guzma from Ultra Space, after which he immediately disbands Team Skull and lets the little bugs fly free. There's definitely some subtext there. And as a guy who will help you fight the rest of the villains in the Pokemon series, he certainly shows off the potential of the bug type. And honestly, I don't think it's the weakest type anyway. That'd probably be Ice or Rock for having so many common weaknesses. Bug's one of my favorite types, actually. It's a surprise counterpick, and Guzma is a surprise countervillain. I'll be honest, I had some trouble picking the last entry for this list. At first I was thinking about Sadler from Resident Evil 4, who captured the Plagas Queen to control Las Plagas and anyone they inhabit, thereby turning a swarm of bugs into a swarm of people with his eventual sights on world domination. Then you got the Grave Mind, who with the Flood is planning the same kind of thing on a galactic scale. There's a lot of overlap we can do with Top 10 Parasites actually, but those are more long-term military strategy, where I want characters using bugs moment to moment in the heat of battle. And again, they don't always have to be bugs, which brings us to Diablo 3. The Witch Doctor combines elements of some classes from past games, mainly the Sorceress, Druid, and Necromancer. So he's got a lot going on, but mainly he's made up of the kind of creepy forest stuff that usually gives the heroes trouble in an Indiana Jones movie. I've always been interested in that term though, Witch Doctor. Originally, the job of a witch doctor was to provide medicine against witchcraft. They were strictly non-magic because magic is scary and bad and I don't want that. But with European explorers misinterpreting these practitioners and their herbal remedies within different indigenous tribes, the term witch doctor became synonymous with, well, witches. Kind of ironic, really. And this is the approach that Diablo takes with its witch doctors. Just a whole bunch of unsettling spells, but at least the doctor's not based on any specific cultures. In this world, they're more like spiritual bouncers, able to sense the flow of life and death through the realms. And when demons are killing too many people at once, well, the witch doctor's gotta step in to tip the scales back to normal. Acting as a summoner, the witch doctor has a lot of pets, some of which I wouldn't really count in this category, such as zombies and skeletons. But other than that, they're like a best of Moses plagues. You got armies of frogs that explode on contact, sprays of flaming bats, spiders that burst from the corpses of defeated zombies, and even a swarm of locusts that will jump to new targets when they're done with the first one. There's certainly variety here, and rather than keeping one army on the field at a time, the Witch Doctor constantly switches to new pests while his other spells cool down. And yeah, I know I keep saying he, but that's because the quote-unquote canon Witch Doctor is a gentleman named Nazebo. He represents the class in Heroes of the Storm, bringing along some toads and spiders, and gargantuans, which are pretty much voodoo golems. Yeah, that definitely doesn't count as vermin, but I think he still has enough to qualify as a Swarm Master, even if he doesn't put all his eggs in one basket. Or... all his egg sacs in one... phylum? Eh. Speaking of MOBA games... Eh, no, sorry. I still haven't played Smite. Not really, anyway. I know Ah Muzan Cobb is a thing, and he's got a whole lot of bees, but I'm gonna have to pass on that. What I was going to say was Dota 2, and how after a couple of years, it finally reintroduced one of my favorite heroes from All Stars, the Broodmother. Pretty simple in concept. She's a giant spider who commands a crap ton of smaller spiders, which by spider standards are still pretty freaking big spiders. If you look back, this bends a rule I made in Beastmasters, that the master has to be of higher intellectual order than the animals they control. I think that's still true here. She's a spider commanding other spiders, but her children are newly hatched. They don't really have sapiens yet. But anyway, Broodmother is an agility-based champion, mostly used as a strong lane pusher. This means that while other heroes might be trying to get early game kills, Broodmother focuses on destroying the turret so that the army can move closer to victory. It's a numbers game with Broodmother's ability to inject her foes with her young. If the target dies in the next few seconds, they'll burst into obedient spiderlings, the quantity growing as you level up that skill. Competent Broodmother players will max this ability first, and spend the first several minutes of the match turning enemy minions into her apocryphal posse. The spiderlings also get this ability, so they can harvest enemies to get even smaller spiders, though fortunately the third generation offspring doesn't reproduce. That'd be nuts. What is nuts is when Broodmother poisons her foes to lower their movement speed, meaning they spend a lot more time covered in spiders. 
and with a vampiric aura, the spiders can actually heal by attacking, making them deceptively resilient. Another ability is Spin Web, letting you create a sizable area of silk that can't be destroyed. In this zone, all spiders are faster, fiercer, and unless they're attacking, invisible. Granted, your opponent can see the web even when they can't see you, but that also means that they're always afraid of you, even when you're not there. With all this combined, Broodmother has a tendency to take over whatever lane she starts in, and if she can get properly fed early on, she'll be a big help in the late game. In theory, you could command your arachnoids separately and try some kind of pincer maneuver, but you really don't have to, just buy some aura items and keep them all in a unified pot of terror. And if this sounds overpowered, well, it's not. While fierce under the right conditions, spiderlings do award golden experience to those who kill them, so you can't just throw them at heroes without a plan. And any kind of area of effect shuts her down fast. But other than that, she is a fun, if somewhat gimmicky hero. League of Legends would eventually make their own version of this champion, Elise. And while I don't say this often, I actually think Dota did it better. It's a stupid concept, and the game just lets you be stupid with it. Welcome to the Forbidden Forest, kids. Come meet the family. One thing I've always admired about the Castlevania series is how it pulls its monsters from so many different sources. Even in the first game, we were mixing Greek mythology with gothic horror, and by the time we got to the DS titles, plenty of Hebrew demons join in on the fun. And wow, these have to be some of the scariest! Take Dawn of Sorrow's Abaddon, for example. His name is actually taken from the fifth angel of the End Times, who is prophesied to open an abyss in the Earth and call forth locusts the size of horses, with human faces and lion teeth that would leave plant life alone but torture mankind for five months straight. That shit's in the Bible, Revelations chapter 9, look it up! Glad they didn't teach that part in Sunday school, I'd still be having nightmares. In comparison, Dawn of Sorrow's Abaddon is rather tame, and suave dare I say rocking a tailcoat over his cricket legs and directing lines of normal-shaped, but still quite large locusts with a conductor's baton. And that... Well, that's really the whole package right there. Not much to him once you get past the horrific source material. Like a lot of bosses in the later Castlevania games, he can be really difficult if you're not prepared, and absolutely trivial if you approach it the right way. Such as life, such as death. He does grant Soma the 5th Plague ability once he dies, so now Soma has his own little posse of bugs to shoot at stuff. I always liked abilities like this, like remember the Hornet Chaser in Mega Man 9? Love that thing! Hornet Man is a similar concept, but Abaddon does it better with longer, more complicated patterns of bugs, and he even makes a reappearance in Portrait of Ruin. I guess it's also worth mentioning there's a boss by the same name in Lords of Shadow 2, but besides the fact that he has minions that spawn from these gross cocoon things, they really aren't following the same bug motif. He may be simple, but I rather respect the dapper grasshopper man. He's a maestro of the macabre, here to play you a swarming symphony. Now let's have some fun. Azure Striker Gunvolt. Made by the team behind Mega Man Zero, Gunvolt plays similarly, except instead of robots, you and your opponents are all adepts, which in this world means you have superpowers. There's the usual boss themes you might expect like ice and fire, but they get pretty creative with some of these. Case in point, Stratos, and his power of... Buds. In his file, Stratos Septima, or power, is listed as the Fly. And while it's unclear what practical applications that would have on its own, like the other bosses, he was taken in by the evil corporation Sumeragi and given a glaive, a kind of transforming sword that increases an adept's power and gives him a crazy robot body. Now, Stratos can convert his body into a swarm of fruit flies to get around, or just shoot fruit flies from his hands. And I mean a lot of fruit flies. A cool thing about this game is how the bosses usually start messing with you before you even get to their boss room. And in Stratos' level, screen-filling waves of flies occasionally pass by. Your electric shield will protect you, but God help you if you're caught off guard without any energy to keep the bug zapper on. You'll be eaten alive! Speaking of eating, each boss of the Sumeragi 7 represents one of the seven deadly sins, something that made me feel really smart when I put it together. But then I realized that the sin is right there in each boss's title. The prideful silhouette, the slothful conjurer, so then I just felt dumb for not realizing it sooner. Anyway, Stratos is this group's gluttony. And I gotta say, this is a pretty cool take on my least favorite sin. 
Most of these Sin-themed rogues galleries would have Gluttony be some big fat guy, the lowest hanging fruit imaginable. But Stratos is gaunt, starving, and that only makes his ravenous appetite worse. Plus, it's not just food he's after. He's addicted to an experimental drug called Seed, and after you destroy the only source of harvesting it, Stratos decides your flesh can help him detox. Look, I know man, withdrawal's hard, but so is this boss fight! Waves of gnats filling the screen, cocoons that explode into heat-seeking cicadas, and his battle armor even transforms into big gnashing jaws. Not exactly bug theme, but it does fit the gluttony theme just fine. All in all, a memorable one-off villain and a nightmare for anyone growing crops. <laughs> Now, there's a difference between being a swarm master and just waxing the whole bug motif. Like Sadira, lots of really cool spider moves, but she actually isn't using a swarm or a brood or anything, just being bug-like. Devora, on the other hand, walks that line a lot better. Introduced in Mortal Kombat X, Devora is a chitin, a species of insects that bond together into a relative shape of a human and form a singular consciousness. She's got a lot of big bug weapons, shooting venom, growing membrane wings, and stabbing with her extra spider legs that double as ovipositors. But like Stratos, she mixes her own disconcerting melee attacks with tons of summoned bugs. Also like Stratos, Devora kind of is the bugs, but she also refers to the bugs as her children, so I guess she's only some of the bugs? I don't know, I'm still wondering why a chitinous hive mind would wear high heels. I'm not gonna think about that too hard. In Mortal Kombat X, two of Devorah's stances especially focus on her minuscule minions. There's her Broodmother variant, which can drop the isopod-like crawlers, hard to block and great for mix-ups, and then there's her Swarm Master variant. Yeah, that one speaks for itself. In Mortal Kombat 11, she's moved into pulling giant hornets out of nowhere, which is just a big ball of nope. Nowhere near as nope as her fatalities, though. She's currently my number one for the cringiest and most disgusting execution move in the series. I'm not eating tonight. For number four, meet the 10 foot tall walking war machine, General Rom from Gears of War. I may not be a Gears fan, but you can't deny how much it influenced the shooty shooty bang bang genre, so I'd be remiss not to talk about Rom in those games first. And looking over the first game, yeah, Rom is an absolute unit. He's a general of the Locust, who after generations of living passively in their subterranean civilization have decided to invade the humans on the surface. And despite the name Locust, Rom and his people aren't actually bugs, they're more reptilian. But Locust does perfectly describe the sheer ferocity of their attacks, and they utilize a lot of weaponized creepy crawlies like the spider-like Reavers, this Alaskan Bullworm, and of course, the Krill. Clarification number two. These krill aren't those aquatic microorganisms that whales like to eat. They're more like... Piranha Bat Moths. What is with Gears and its alien names? Misnomer or not, the krill are kind of terrifying. They can eat a man down to nothing in a matter of seconds, and tend to show up in the millions, a krill storm as they call it. Their one weakness is their sensitivity to light, but once the sun sets, they're practically unstoppable which leads to one of the more memorable missions in the series. For how macho this game is, seeing the cogs utterly helpless against these things leaves an impact. So what does all this have to do with Rom? Well, it turns out he can command these little buggers. And this isn't a common thing for locusts either, we've seen them get krill to death too. To the best of my knowledge, there's not a real reason Rom can order these bats around, so I guess it's just something that the elite guards can do. His krill can even follow him into the daylight, and I'm calling hacks on that one. Most of the time, they buzz around him as a protective shield, so between the krill, the heavy armor, and the thick skin, Rom is basically bulletproof. Sadly, he and the entire population of krill are killed in the first game, leaving Scorg to run things in his stead, who's not nearly as interesting. But Rom was brought back fully playable in the Gears of 3 DLC, Rom's Shadow, 
and it's just a massive power trip. And on that note, let's look at Killer Instinct. While Rom is often known to carry around a turret gun like a crocodilian heavy weapons guy, for his fighting game debut, he decided to play fair and bring only his serrated combat knife. Oh, and several hundred krill! They can absorb attacks for him, start grapples, and any attack with them leaves a swarm on your opponent that causes gray damage until they can get a hit on Rom. This can trick your opponent into a desperate state and cause them to make some easily punishable mistakes. It's amazing how much Rom controls the flow of his fights. And during his instinct mode, there's the Krill Storm. Constant, constant gray damage unless they're hitting Rom. Were you watching that fight? Because I can barely see a thing now. He may not be one of the faster fighters, but he really doesn't have to be. His pets are doing all of the work, so he's just gotta throw in a little elbow grease. Not even crest high walls can save you now. The Legend of Zelda series is beloved for many reasons, but one that doesn't get enough credit is its sense of personality, particularly with NPCs. I've already talked about how memorable its shopkeepers are, but each game also hosts a hive of one-off quest givers that'll stay with you for years to come. Sometimes fans really cling to one particular character, like they did with this little weirdo, Agatha from Twilight Princess. There's not a ton to her, she's just a little girl who really likes bugs. Really? really likes bugs. Like, I'm talking morbid obsession. She claims she's the princess of insects, has invited 24 golden bugs from across Hyrule to attend her ball, but they must have gotten lost on their way there. Surely a strapping hero like Link can gather them up for her. And that's about as far as it goes. Find some bugs and you'll get some rupees and wallet upgrades. It's just the way she talks about them though. Like, apparently she can really talk to them, she sings songs for each bug you bring her, implies that she really likes it when they sting and bite her, and I don't know about anyone else, but I think this girl might need a little help. Maybe we should stage an intervention or something? So, yeah, one-off character at the end of it all. If Nintendo wanted more bug-themed quests in the future games, they'd appoint them to new NPCs like Stritch and Skyward Sword. That's what makes each game feel so fresh, but WAIT! GO BACK! said the franchise. That design is way too interesting to just be the girl who upgrades her wallet. And apparently Tecmo Koei agreed, and chose to continue Agatha's story in Hyrule Warriors. In Twilight Princess, it kind of seemed like her title was self-proclaimed. Agatha wasn't really bug royalty, she just liked them a lot. Or maybe she was. The ambiguity is part of the fun. But in Hyrule Warriors, yeah, Agatha is back and ready to show you her true power. Not only can she finish her basic attack strings with lines of butterflies, she can summon giant butterflies to ride on, or enormous rhino beetles to crash through enemy battalions. She even grows golden bug wings for one of her Musou attacks. I always thought the gold color was just to make the collectible bugs stick out, but now it makes total sense that they're somehow magical. And small hilarious detail, Agatha can pick locks. You find this out during the Twilight Invasion scenario, and she claims that she learned it from termites. So, how do we compare Rom, who's practically unstoppable, to Agatha, who's maybe more vulnerable but also takes out enemies at a faster rate? Well, Rom usually has a minigun or something, and Agatha, besides a basket, a parasol, and some small-time magic, fights mainly with bugs. So yeah, a giant hulking harbinger of destruction just got beat out by a little fairy princess. I have a weird job. Three years ago, in a list about ghosts, I made this joke. We've just hit about every other member of the Cobra unit. Now I just have to find a countdown to talk about the pain. Top 10 B-wheelers? Well, anyway. I've held on to that idea ever since, and finally, here he is. And boy, am I glad he's so close to the top. The pain, not to be confused with the phantom pain, is a boss in Metal Gear Solid 3. Apparently at a young age, he caught a parasite that caused him to secrete a bee-controlling pheromone. Not something you usually see on a resume, but as a result, he became a hornet soldier. Oh god, I hope he's the only one. 
and was hired as a member of the Allied Forces Cobra Unit, alongside a sniper, a poison user, a pyromancer, a ghost, and a tragic boss fight. Hey, I said my job was weird, I never said I didn't like it. Through a combination of his pheromones and a captured Queen Hornet in his back pocket, the pain commands his swarm with shocking accuracy. He directs them towards Snake with pheromone grenades, uses their buzzing to cover the sounds of his movements, and like Rom, makes himself bulletproof by forming them into a kind of flak jacket. A yellow jacket, if you will. They're easier to blast away with a shotgun or grenades, but he's got some extra tricks up his sleeve, such as having the swarm copy the shape of his body and act as a decoy. Uh, Bekoi. He's outfitted himself into a living hive, with the hornets living in his clothes and even his body. This is the closest we're gonna get to Shino today. And nothing can prepare you for the bullet bees. This dude can spit bees that move as fast as hornets, and can burrow into Snake and eat him from the inside out. According to some cassette tapes, he can actually control all kinds of insects, but he sticks to hornets since they're his favorite. You gotta commend that dedication, he's covered in stings and welts all the time, but since his parasites also produce extra adrenaline, it's not really an issue. He's not winning any beauty pageants, but he'll always be Queen Bee to me. Now if only they made some kind of repellent for these jokes, seriously. If we're sticking to purely bugs and purely things much smaller than oneself, then, yeah, the pain takes the cake. A cake that's probably really infested by now. But there's one more candidate that, although a little unorthodox, I just could not see the top spot without. Hornet swarms, krill swarms, golden butterfly swarms? All shrivel in comparison to the single-minded offensive of a swarm of Pikmin. Trapped on an alien planet with a toxic atmosphere, Captain Olimar, lowly delivery man of the Hokutate Freight Company, hitched up his bootstraps and asserted himself as the leader of a subservient race, half flora, half fauna. Maybe not what you'd think of as a swarm, and shouldn't swarm masters be bigger than each individual swarm member? Well, remember that a swarm doesn't have to be bugs, the krill aren't even arthropods, and Nazebo has all kinds of mammals and amphibians mixed into his collection. And as for size, Agatha's biggest attacks are with freaking Mothra. Pigmen are only about an inch tall, and it just so happens that so is Olimar. And he regularly uses them to topple beasts ten times his size. Pigmen may be humanoid, but they behave with a hive-like mentality, following Olimar based on the light on his antenna and the frequency of his whistle. Olimar certainly fits the Swarm Master build, but is he the best? And what does that even mean for this list? Well, by virtue of the fact that he's basically commanding a tiny little army of mites, Olimar is pretty good at what he does. While at home, he's bossed around by the company president. Here on PNF 404, he's the king, the CEO, and the commander-in-chief, flinging Pikmin onto his aggressors so they can latch on and beat the beasts to death, or just calling his posse to bum-rush his targets. I'm sure you know the different classifications by now. You got your fireproof red Pikmin, your insulated, high-arcing yellows, the seafaring blues, the poisonous whites, the heavyweight purples, thick skin rocks, and aerial winged Pikmin. I know those last two premiered in Pikmin 3, which starred a different group of Pikmasters, but Olimar still uses all varieties in Pikmin 3's challenge mode, and he's got more games under his belt than Louis, Alf, and any other pilots. Maybe Olimar's not the most formidable threat on this list, that still might be Rom, honestly, but Olimar's movesets are completely committed to his swarm. No knives, no guns, not even a parasol. Just some sprays that accomplish nothing without his Pikmin around, and a little punch which I admit I've used a few times to solo enemies when I was too afraid to lose Pikmin. Especially in Pikmin 2. That game has some scary enemies, but that's just a testament to what Olimar's overcome. The Emperor Bullblacks, the Men at Legs, the freaking Water Wraiths! And, of course, Smash Brothers. You've probably heard discussions like this before. If the characters were able to do everything they could in their original games, who would be the strongest? Well, I don't know if Olimar could realistically take on Bayonetta, heck, it's charitable enough for the game to scale him up to people size, but imagine if Olimar was allowed to keep up to 100 Pikmin with him like he does in his own games. I'm overwhelmed just thinking about it. 
and that is why Olimar takes the throne as the greatest Swarm Master in video game history. I don't know if that's a question that needed answering, but now you know. I'm the Green Scorpion, and thank you for joining me for this pair of animal-themed countdowns. Next time, we'll look at something a little more human. Well, about 50% more. Time to gear up.